All right. Good day, everyone. My name is Riley Edwards, and I'd like to welcome you to the virtual William W. Hay Railroad Engineering Seminar. Before I introduce today's speaker, I want to remind listeners that you can ask questions using the question box on the side of your screen, and I will read them to the speaker at the end of today's presentation. To introduce our seminar series, the William W. Hay Seminar Series is sponsored by the Rail Transportation and Engineering Center here at the University of Illinois in Urbana-Champaign. On behalf of all of us here in Railtech, we'd like to thank the Association of American Railroads, BNSF, CN, Hanson Professional Services, and Union Pacific for their ongoing support of Railtech. It's greatly appreciated by all of us that have benefited from these seminars. I'd like to extend a welcome today to more than 200 people who have signed up from eight countries and five continents. This includes representatives from freight and passenger railroads, transit organizations, federal and state DOTs, engineering firms, universities, research organizations, and technology suppliers. We're very pleased that you can join us for our summer seminar, and uh, we know that it's going to be another exciting uh, presentation today. For those of you that wish to receive PDHs for your participation, please send us an email at heyseminar.illinois.edu with your information as it was described in the announcement you received via email for today's seminar. This is the first of at least two summer seminars that we'll be having, the next of which is one week from today, and I'll provide more details on it at the end of today's presentation. I want to briefly introduce today's seminar by Mr. Gary Wolf, who's back today by popular demand to give part two of his presentation that he, he started in uh, last month in April. So as a brief abstract of today's presentation, we know that continued technological advances and opportunities for their adoption in the rail industry abound, and many of these are being implemented by today's railroads. Despite these advancements, derailment rates have generally remained constant in recent years. What do railroads, regulators, and investigators need to do in the era of precision scheduled railroading to further reduce these derailment rates? In part one of Mr. Wolf's seminar, back in April, he presented a case for further lowering the derailment rate in North America. He discussed overarching strategic initiatives, and he, uh, he built upon some of those. He also talked about the downstream effects of PSR on rail operations and how that relates to derailment rates. In today's presentation by Mr. Wolf, he's going to build on his initial presentation and go into greater detail on 12 tactical initiatives and objectives for achieving a reduction in derailment rate. To so briefly introduce today's speaker, Mr. Gary Wolf has over 50 years of experience in the rail industry, including 17 at the Southern and Norfolk Southern Railways, 26 as a consultant and owner of Rail Sciences, and the last seven years in private consulting practice. He has a Bachelor's of Science degree in Electrical Engineering from Ohio University and a Master's of Science from Georgia Tech in Industrial Management. Among other, other organizations, he's a member of ASME, ARIMA, and the Air Brake Association. And now Mr. Wolf will present today's seminar titled Essential Strategies for Derailment Elimination in Today's PSR Environment, Part 2. So welcome back, Gary. Thank you, Riley. Uh, it's good to be here. And uh, thanks to all of you who have uh, stayed on board this uh, Friday and not cut out early for Memorial Day. Uh, we appreciate your uh, participation. Just a brief pause here for those of you in America or USA here. This weekend is our Memorial Day when we honor our uh, fallen comrades who have defended our freedom and those of many, those uh, fr the freedoms of many others around the world. So I ask you all to keep that in perspective this Memorial Day weekend. Now there's some breaking news to start with. Uh, since my last presentation, uh, two recent developments. Last week it came out that uh, the, uh, Congressman DeFazio has asked for a GAO accountability study of the impact of PSR on rail shippers, employees, and safety, underlying safety. Um, apparently, the drumbeat is rolling about this, and, and there's some things. Now, the last thing I want is a bunch of government bureaucrats studying PSR, but we may be head, headed in that direction. The second development is Mr. Grady Cawthon, who is the retired uh, FRA Deputy Associate Administrator for Safety Standards, has authored a white paper, a very uh, uh, detailed white paper entitled The Management of In-Train Forces, Challenges and Directions. And this has also been authored with an eye towards PSR and some of the changes in train handling and train makeup that we're seeing 
So stay tuned for how these two developments impact uh, where we're going today. Now, in our last session, I sort of laid out some strategic goals and a strategic plan is basically where are we going? It's a goal, a destination. And I laid out a, a goal last time of trying to reach 1.0 derailments per million train miles in, in our country. And now today, I'm going to give you some tactical plans and strategies, some hands-on stuff that will help us get there. As you remember, in the last presentation, I laid out the fact that since about 2010, our derailment and train accident rates have been flat and even slightly increasing, which is not a good trend when you're trying to uh, improve the, the safety and reliability of your operations. I also laid out the fact that human factor derailments were also on an increasing trend. And also in red in this chart, you see how the, the cost per derailment is, is uh, wildly uh, changing up and down, uh, depending on the severity of some of these human factor accidents. And whenever you have costs that you cannot closely control, uh, that's not a good situation. Now, what are the 12 strategies here I'm going to lay out for you? Number one is uh, starting at the top, we need to develop a corporate focus. We need to also take advantage of our network of integrated and automated inspection systems. And then three, the data from these devices need to be leveraged, uh, which is often termed uh, big data. I'll get to that in a moment. Number four is to ensure correct curve elevations. And I touched on that in the last session. I said in light of changing train lengths and perhaps slower trains at times or longer trains, our curve elevations may not be properly set up. Number five is to manage what goes on at the wheel rail interface. Number six is to develop and take advantage of a, an effective rail lubrication program. Number seven is to eliminate rail camp. And if you don't know what that is, stay tuned. I'll explain that in a minute. Uh, number eight on the vehicle side is to eliminate tight side bearings and excessive friction we uh, wedge rise when in, uh, inspected or found. Number nine is to manage your CWR and its rail neutral temperature to avoid track buckle derailments in the summer and pull aparts in the winter. Number 10 is to develop train makeup rules and strategies uh, building on the uh, paper that Mr. Cawthon just authored uh, in light of what's going on with uh, changes in our trains uh, over the last couple of years. Number 11 is to perform uh, much more detailed and in-depth root cause analysis on human failures. And I brought up some case studies last time about how we were merely describing what went on, such as run over a derail, run through a switch, but we're not describing the why. And we need to do more on that. Number 12 is to increase our focus on drainage and water management conditions. And I'll explain why I think that's important. And as a bonus, a baker's dozen here, uh, very last slide, I'll talk about some better inspections on turnouts. Now, with this presentation, uh, I'm going to lay out some things, and I don't mean to imply that this is all you need to be doing. Uh, there's lots of other things that you need to continue doing. And every rail system needs to assess what is proper and needed uh, for their particular system. Also, I mentioned I will mention different products and uh, companies in this uh, presentation, and this is not meant to be an endorsement of anything. And I urge everyone to uh, check out these products and companies on their own and see what's suitable for your railroad. Number one, develop a corporate focus on derailment prevention. This starts right at the top of every organization. I I know about six, seven years ago, I think every class one railroad had a director or higher level called uh, director of train accident prevention or director derailment prevention. And over the last several years, a lot of those functions have uh, gone away. And I think that's a, a, a bad thing. I think we need to refocus our efforts given that we're not making progress on this very important topic. So it must start from the top of the organization. And the organization must be committed to the process. And the process must be embedded in the corporate culture. Every morning when you wake up, every meeting you attend, derailment prevention should be foremost on your mind. And I don't like when it's when people say, well, it's everybody's responsibility for derailment prevention. Yeah, I know that's true. But the problem is when you assign it to everybody, uh, it ends up being nobody's responsibility. And that's true of, of anything in life. Uh, an organization needs a leader and someone that is there taking charge. The individual must own the process and must be accountable for its success. Now, 
the corporate ownership of derailment prevention, as I just said, you need a, a mentor, a champion at the corporate level, uh, hopefully director level or, or above to, to focus this uh, uh, strategy. Uh, you should have a neutral reporting relationship in the organization to avoid departmental biases. Uh, the director should es establish accountability and, and as well as establish the missions, goals, objectives, and strategy for that particular railroad. What I've found has been very useful in the past are multidisciplinary derailment prevention teams, and I stress not committees. I don't think committees uh, really have a goal to get anything done, but teams have a goal of winning the game. And I stress teamwork, not co committee attendees. Uh, it's good to have divisional field teams that work in conjunction with the corporate headquarters, and these teams should comprise engineering, mechanical, operations, and others. And it should have a revolving leadership amongst those various constituencies. And a very another important part of this is statistical analysis. The old saying is, if you can't measure it, you can't manage it. And we need to keep detailed records on our derailments, both FRA reportable and non-reportable. And in addition, assign accurate costs of failure, taking into account all costs. And in our last presentation, I outlined uh, all the many, many cost items that are not accounted for when you just look at the FRA uh, cost. Now, derailment prevention, as many of you know who have attended my seminary uh, sem uh, seminars, not seminary, seminars, uh, know that I focus on accurate cost finding because that's what prevents a recurrence of a derailment on that section of track or with that particular vehicle or vehicle type or that particular crew. And it's the old saying from Mr. Santayana, those who cannot remember the past are condemned to repeat it. So if we don't learn from our mistakes, we're probably going to have repeats. Accurate cost finding starts with an unbiased, multidisciplinary approach. The word unbiased is easy to say. It's often hard to uh, implement in the corporate world, I know, with very departmental groups and things. But we've got to remain unbiased when we go into a, a cost finding effort. It must be done in a timely manner. We can't wait days or weeks to study the derailments. Uh, they must be done while the iron is hot, and we must figure things out and get the conclusions out to everybody. Any uh, cost-finding efforts should be objective and data-driven with track measurements and car and truck inspection data, using event recorder data and train handling analysis, in some cases, metallurgical analysis, and in other cases, simulation analysis should supplement the on track uh, investigation effort. And then from any cost finding effort, you have to develop corrective actions. Uh, if you don't do this step, you're missing out. We gotta walk away from every derailment with a list of one, two, three, four items that we're gonna change, we're gonna improve, et cetera. And these corrective actions must be cost effective within our corporate capabilities. And we should always step away and look at any potential unattended consequences from any corrective actions or changes. So warnings about derailment cause finding. Remember that uh, most derailments have multiple causations. Uh, sometimes it's easy to pin it on one thing, but uh, it's usually multiple conditions that come together to put a vehicle on the ground. But it is still our goal to develop or determine the primary or root cause and sort that out from the uh, contributory causes or secondary causes. And don't be surprised in your investigation if you don't find a direct violation of AER rules, uh, FRA or Transport Canada track safety standards, or any of your many operating rules. And why is this? Because number one, standards don't cover everything. Uh, this is why standards are frequently updated on a yearly or every two or three year basis, because we uncover things through the process of investigation that needs to become a standard. So don't assume the standards are there to cover everything. And also, secondly, standards don't take into account multiple deviations, both uh, between and within standards. You can have a little bit of something on the car side and something on the, on the track side, but taken together, uh, synergistically, it can add up to a, a derailment. And always remember what you're looking at is a fact that you may have discovered the need for a new standard or rule uh, or rules that need updating. And finally, remember that the greater the number of deviations from standards that you tolerate in your system, whether on the car side, the track side, or train operations, 
the higher the probability of a derailment is. Because basically uh, what, what the process is, is managing risk. If we want zero risk, don't let the uh, car leave the yard. But once the wheel starts turning, running down the track at 40 miles an hour, you've developed risk and you've got to manage that risk by keeping all factors uh, within standards. Now, why don't we get the correct cause? Well, a lot of it has to do with departmental biases and infighting among departments. Uh, that's unfortunate or just lack of a systematic or analytical approach, a sloppy investigation where we don't go out there and come back with facts, data, measurements, photographs, et cetera. We merely come back with opinions and that doesn't get the job done. In some places, it's lack of motivation. I've heard people say, ah, oh, that's just a two wheel derailment. That's the cost of doing business. We don't need to worry about it. But that two wheel derailment today could be a 20 car derailment tomorrow if uh, you don't find out what, what caused it. Sometimes it's poor communication and cooperation between departments and across departments. Uh, sort of that uh, number one bullet up there, the biases and things that occur in, in the process of investigation. Uh, being rushed or rushing around trying to get a quick cause uh, is not good. I know a lot of times management wants to cause within uh, 10 or 12 hours, and sometimes it takes longer to get a good cause. And then sometimes we go in looking for obvious causes based on our historical perspective, and that puts the blinders on us to discover new things or conditions that we may not have considered. Basic problem with cause finding is many derailments and accidents are organizational accidents, meaning the root cause is embedded within the corporate uh, system of, of rules and how we do things, our procedures, et cetera. Yet we're not drilling down to the root cause level to adequately determine all these issues. We often stop at the individual level, that is somebody to blame or a group to blame, and we only identify symptoms and conditions like calling something wide gauge. Wide gauge is not a root cause. That's, that's a result of something. Track buckle is not a root cause. That's a result of, of conditions that you've left unattended. And so when we just blame it on these nebulous terms like wide gauge and things, we're not getting root causes. And in order to reduce your risk, all causative factors must be identified and appropriate corrective actions taken. So the basic question that folks ask in any accident is how were our defenses breached? We do all these good things with detectors and rules and procedures and training. And how did we breach those defenses? There's typically three factors implicated. Human performance issues uh, surrounding our rules, technical systems, such as our infrastructure and our vehicles, and then organizational issues, such as our culture, our budgets, and how we manage things. And all three of these factors are governed by two processes that are central to any organization. That is production, uh, which means making things. It could be widgets in a factory. In our case, in the rail industry, production is moving goods uh, from one shipper to a destination. Along with that, though, we have to have protection, which is safety and rules and inspections along the way. And those two things vie for corporate attention, for corporate budgets at all times. If you overprotect with too many burdensome rules, you'll go bankrupt. And if you underprotect, you may go bankrupt because you'll have catastrophes. So it's a delicate balance that we must uh, uh, keep in mind. Some trends that I've noticed over the years in derailment cost finding is many of the understanding or many of the easy to understand causes have been eliminated. And as wheel loads and speeds increase, causes have become more complex, often requiring understanding of the wheel rail mechanism, which say prior to the 1990s, not a lot of attention was paid to wheel rail mechanisms. But as we move from 100 ton cars to 286 to 315,000 pound cars, this is more important than ever. And with longer trains, quote, uh, in parentheses there, PSR, uh, train makeup and handling has become a much bigger issue to take into account. And the higher stress state in the rail environment, especially at the wheel rail level, has mandated a better understanding of fatigue mechanisms. And that's both materials and humans. You know, when we speak of fatigue, we typically talk about rails or wheels or, or steel uh, materials, but also the human being also be, can become fatigued with higher stress states. And due to downsizing, privatization, attrition, retirements, our industry knowledge level has declined considerably. And, and as a result, better training and tools are required 
for modern derailment investigation. Step two, next uh, strategy is uh, de to develop and utilize a network of automated inspection and detection de uh, devices. Now, most of you know we have uh, uh, a pretty good network of modern detection technology along with a, a good communications backbone uh, to detect incipient conditions before they become derailments. We have wayside systems, onboard systems, uh, on-track uh, vehicle-mounted systems to detect track faults, and now we also have locomotive-mounted systems uh, that prevent collisions and speed violations, etc. Turning to infrastructure monitoring, which is the track structure primarily, uh, we have legacy systems that have been out there from anywhere from 30 to 40 to 50 years, such as track geometry measurement, rail flaw detection, uh, slide detectors, uh, uh, and, and things like this. Uh, in, the, in the recent 10 or 20 years, things like uh, GRMS, uh, rail friction measurements, uh, et cetera, have also come along. But now we have some new and developing technologies, uh, such as automated cross-tie inspection and grading, uh, vision systems that can look at fasteners, bolts, missing spikes, loose joint bar bolts, rail seat abrasions, things like that. Uh, track deflection measurements, as the M-Rail system can do. Uh, rail surface conditions, such as uh, monitoring rolling contact fatigue with machine vision. And then rail neutral temperature monitoring is something else. So you've all seen these systems. Uh, they've been around your railroad, uh, geometry cars, flaw, flaw detection cars. Uh, GRMS systems like the Holland Track Star and uh, optical rail wheel uh, profile measurement systems uh, shown here in the ARM truck. Today we have some emerging technologies like Doppler radar, automated joint bar inspections, automated cross tie grading and inspection, the uh, uh, Georgetown rail uh, uh, system there in the upper left, and the M rail system to measure uh, deflection. We also have some recent developments. Uh, the uh, RailPod system, which is a robotic uh, machine that can drive up and down your track through a joystick controller, belt pack controller, and collect uh, rail flow and geometry data. Uh, Tetra Tech has uh, developed some autonomous uh, track geometry cars, as has ENSCO, I believe. We have uh, the Raman uh, eddy current uh, crack detection system and Vortox uh, multi sensor. Now, on the wayside, uh, uh, developments. We have, uh, this is to measure vehicles. Uh, legacy systems have been out there for a while, like hot box detectors, dragging equipment detectors, uh, high and wide, etc. And now we have uh, some new and developing technologies, a lot of them based on machine vision that can actually measure wet drives, brake shoe thickness, coupler securement bolts, uh, ladders, grab irons, platforms, and uh, uh, other methods for hot box detectors. So some of these legacy systems like T-Bogey and TPDs and wild systems and hotbox systems have been around for years. And now we're moving into more machine vision uh, and more ultrasonic uh, type devices to uh, measure uh, roller bearing integrity as well as wheel integrity. And then on the onboard side, we've also had some developments uh, in technology such as event recorders, onboard video cameras, uh, conditioning monitoring of locomotive performance. And now we have vision systems. I'll show you one of those in a second. Positive train control has been around for a while and communication-based train control. And what we need though is greater leverage of these two last two systems, uh, PTC and CBTC, uh, to build out the platform for better payback. Yeah, it's great to prevent collisions, but I think there's a lot more uh, PTC can do uh, now that we've got it installed on a large percentage of our network. So you've all seen event recorders and they've been around since the 1970s. Uh, video systems started coming out around 2000. We now have inward facing cameras, uh, multi-camera views as shown in the upper left on a commuter train. Uh, uh, so we've made great strides with our event recorder and video technology. Uh, a company in Israel has now developed a vision system they can be placed on a locomotive for object detection, such as uh, stalled vehicles, uh, trespassers on the track, uh, animals on the track, and things like this. This is, a, I think, an important component uh, for uh, moving towards autonomous train operation. And here's the uh, typical PTC architecture that we've got in place to prevent 
collisions. I think most people are aware of its capabilities. And then we have some vehicle remote monitoring systems, uh, the Vitronics Violet system for locomotives that can measure uh, me or, uh, capture a number of uh, locomotive performance uh, uh, measurements. And then we have uh, uh, remote vehicle monitoring systems that can be placed on individual wagons or cars to measure things like load status, uh, temperature of the commodity, hatch securement, brake sensors, et cetera. And these are all emerging technologies that are uh, becoming more commonplace. So there's been significant advancements, certainly in the last 15 years in automated detection systems. Uh, the new and emerging technologies, I think, need further testing and investment to prove benefits. And also we need support uh, to get away uh, from the regulatory author authorities to get away from some of the uh, costly mandate of uh, inspections. I think we need incentives uh, to, to develop more automated systems. Uh, these devices also eliminated the uh, subjectivity of human inspection and improved the day-to-day -day reliability of inspection. You know, human beings fit the famous bell curve, and we have some good ones, we have some marginal ones, and we have some downright bad ones. But in a machine vision system, everyone can be an A-plus inspector, and we need to change these uh, various finders into fixtures. So to, to increase the development and deployment of these automated devices, as I said a moment ago, I think we need some relief from mandated and costly uh, and antiquated, in some cases, uh, manual inspections that have been around for well over 50 years. Uh, and maybe some waivers and things are starting to develop at the FRA level. Uh, I've seen some things in the past year or two on, on some waivers for autonomous uh, track geometry car usage. So I think that's a good trend. The rail industry can move uh, from a reactive maintenance system to a more proactive and predictive maintenance system with automated detectors. And the big challenge facing every railroad is what to do with all this data. And this segues into my next slide on big data. We just can't have human beings sitting there pouring through uh, spreadsheets and databases. So here we go. Strategy number three is to leverage our big data. Uh, that we're collecting with all these various systems. If you don't know it, we're now in the industrial revolution called 4.0. Uh, 1.0 started with the steam engine 200 years ago, and they say now uh, the current uh, environment is Industry 4.0, uh, which en encompasses the uh, Internet of Things, as, as the term has been coined. I always thought it was a weird term, but that's what it is. And basically, uh, Industry 4.0 is the connectivity and automation of industrial processes. When you think about it, a moving train now, uh, both the infrastructure and the train has all kinds of sensors that can be linked through the internet, through wayside uh, Wi-Fi systems, uh, cellular systems, uh, Bluetooth systems, et cetera, to move all this data to central sites for storage and anal analyzing. When you're dealing with big data, the three big Ds are volume, velocity, and variety. That is, how much data do you have to deal with? How fast is it coming in? And how many types of data are we dealing with? And if you don't know it, we're now in what's called the zettabyte era, which is a zettabyte is one trillion gigabytes. Uh, the amount of data being collected daily in the rail industry, I've heard all kind of wild estimates from, from terabytes to hundreds of terabytes a day. And the key is how to manage this. Some of the benefits of, of using this big data is the more data you have, the more complete information you'll get. And with bigger databases, you have less standard deviation of the data and your correlation coefficients, your R squared values become uh, increasingly higher. But data in and of itself has zero value unless it can be used to create value, monetary value of some sort. Now, what big data can allow us to do is to move from fixers to preventers to predictors to genies. In the first step, reactive maintenance is we fix what's broken. That's the wild system that's been around for 25 years. Flat wheel out there, go fix it. The preventive system is to use data to prevent future failures, like the varying temperature trending that was developed uh, by Todd Snyder on Union Pacific, uh, to predict incipient failures before they become uh, catastrophic failures. The next step is to move to predictive maintenance, 
when we can use uh, the data on mileage, tonnage, wheel profile, temperature, et cetera, to determine when the bearing might fail. And then finally, the prescriptive maintenance is when you can use artificial intelligence and machine learning to tell us how to fix the problem and to prevent future failures. So to, data, uh, to make it happen, you need what's called data analytics. Now you may have to either insource or outsource the data analytics function. It's a kind of a new uh, career path, if you will, uh, that's been developed in the last 10 or 15 years. Um, it's a process, what data analytics is, is a process of sifting or analyzing the raw data to reach statistically valid conclusions. And there's a number of techniques can be can be used to, to analyze data, such as Monte Carlo simulation, regression analysis, both linear and nonlinear. A new one is multivariate adaptive regression splines, which is a form of uh, nonlinear regression, and then time series analyses are just a few. Some warnings or caveats is make sure your sensors and systems are producing reliable data. Uh, a key component in the in the uh, vehicle side are car tags or AEI tags, and if we get those uh, mis uh, uh, misplaced on the car or reversed, or if we get uh, if, we, if they're missing or vandalized, uh, we're going to have a lot of uh, errors in our database. And whether it's geometry or rail flaw detection, uh, you want to be sure you have reliable data. You also have to perform statistical process control on your data values to ensure. Uh, to ensure their reliability and confidence levels. And you also now need data governance within any organization. That might be one person or it might be a group of people who look over this data and, and assure its quality, uh, maintain privacy of the data. Security is a big thing today. Uh, cybersecurity is, it should be at the forefront of every railroad. We just had a, a massive ransomware attack on the East Coast to uh, the major fuel oil pipeline. It put, I know here in Atlanta, we lost gasoline for four or five days. And these things are becoming more commonplace. So security should be at the top of your mind. And then also retention of the data. How long should we keep it? Where should we keep it? On a cloud, on a server, in a data warehouse. And finally, how trustworthy is the data? Uh, is it good data or has it been corrupted? And here's another idea is to use data analytics to look at our human factor derailments. We always think of data analytics, looking at rail flaw data or wheel failure data or hotbox data, but I'd like to see it used on the softer side of railroading, the, the human failure side. Number four, ensure correct curve elevations. You know, we put elevation in our curves to counterbalance centrifugal forces, and that's a good thing, but we have to ensure that the elevation is consistent for the speeds that the train is running. And the amount of elevation is a factor of our speed squared or velocity squared. Now, if we have over-elevated curves, we got problems. And many over-elevated curves are a legacy from prior operating conditions before we had longer and slower and larger trains. It could also be a legacy from prior owners, like short lines that inherit a, a, a cast off from a class one railroad that used to be a class three track. And now the short line runs it at class one, 10 mile an hour, which creates a number of over-elevated curves on day one. And then when you try to mix freight and passenger in the same corridor, like we do in some cities, uh, we also have curve elevation issues. Uh, secondly, under elevated curves are not, not good also, but I don't find that as much as a, pro a problem as, as having over elevated curves. Now, excess, what, what happens with excessive elevation is it puts adverse vertical forces on the low rail of curves. It throws a lot of weight to the inside which can result in broken rails, broken joint bars, and low rail rollover, and at the other end of the spectrum, wheel climb on the opposite rail or the high rail. Many curves in North America are currently over-elevated given current train operating speeds, and short lines are especially vulnerable. And when operating in over-elevated curves, your derailment risk increases when encountering significant track perturbations like cross-level twist or warp, uh, although they may be FRA or Transport Canada compliant, when you're in an over-elevated curve, you're already at the high risk level, and that can put you over the edge. As an illustration, when you run a curve at the correct uh, equilibrium speed, say 42 mile an hour for this curve, the vertical forces will be exactly balanced in the center of the track, 
and the wheel loads on inner rail and outer rail are identical. That's a good situation. On the left, when we run too slow, we throw a disproportionate amount of weight onto the low side of the curve, which increases our chance of rollover derailments. And on the high side of the curve, increases our chances of wheel climb because we're taking weight off of that wheel. Now, the objective should be to elevate the majority of your curves at anywhere from one to two inches under balance. And to do that, you need to review your actual, and I emphasize actual train speeds, not timetable speeds, uh, but actual speeds on every territory. You can use speed tape or event recorder analysis. You can do train writing and reporting, and you can back it up with simulation. And also try to eliminate unnecessary speed changes, all the ups and downs and uh, curves and things. Try to, to smooth those out. The way you start is with a prioritized list of improper elevations and attack the worst ones first and move down your list as budgets permit. And uh, also look to change speed limits for short-term solution if necessary, if you actually got to make a, a, a temporary speed reduction. And also, I just want to keep in mind that in your spirals, also keep a good eye on your spiral runoff rates. Anytime you get to about uh, two inches over 62 feet, uh, you're putting a lot of cars at, at an elevated risk status. Uh, strategy number five is to manage the wheel rail interface. And there's a lot that goes on right there in that area that's about the size of a dime, but it's actually an elliptical dime, if you will, around a half a square inch of area. But that's where all the weight of the wheels go. 38, 37, 40,000 pounds uh, vertical load is applied there on that very small area. And pressures can reach 50,000 to 100,000 PSI. And your management of the wheel row interface is going to be either conducive to good performance and long asset life. And if you don't measure or don't manage it correctly, you're going to have short asset life uh, and derailment risk elevated. Now, higher axle loads and got something here got some warning i hope you can still hear me uh, higher axle loads and higher wheel rail stresses and higher requirements for for higher adhesion levels such as the ac locomotives uh, and at times higher drawbar forces all mandate a more proactive approach a more rigorous approach to managing the wheel rail interface Riley, is my audio still on? Can somebody tell me? Your audio, you sound great, Gary. It's a little fuzzy, a bit, but that doesn't matter. Just keep going. Okay. So why do we need to manage the wheel rail interface? Well, number one, if we let surface conditions or rolling contact fatigue develop, uh, it's going to allow uh, the development of broken rails. And so grinding is necessary to eliminate uh, RCF development and ultimately broken rails. The profile shape of the rail uh, is there to minimize our contact stresses, to maximize our steering effect, to minimize our probability of wheel climb and minimize the probability of rail rollover. I'll get to those in just a moment. And the profile shape of the wheel, remember this is wheel rail interface, it's a system, there's two objects here. Also is important uh, that the wheel be shaped properly to minimize contact stress and the development of wheel shells and to minimize high speed instability, which is truck hunting. We don't like truck hunting at higher speeds. And also we wanna maximize steering in all curves to prevent gauge widening. So here's some examples of worn rail and worn wheels. And when rail profiles become worn, they lead to wheel climb. They, they have wheel set steering problems. They make it conducive to uh, rail rollover or gauge widening derailments and uh, the development of rolling contact fatigue. And as I said, wheels, if their profile shape is not managed, you're gonna have hunting and lack of steering. Now here's an example of the familiar high rail uh, gauge corner shelling that occurs uh, due to insufficient rail grinding or insufficient lubrication or combinations of both. And when you have a heavy development of shells, you also develop these uh, detail fractures or transverse defects that can grow inward from these surface conditions. 
Another thing that is common with uh, rail profile management is the development of spalls on the low side of curves. This is a typical contact pattern of a wheel on the low rail of a curve. And you see that the uh, stresses, the, the vertical stresses are concentrated towards the field side, especially with the hollow worn treads with a false flange. And you see the resultant on the rail uh, development of uh, the spalling action. So the shape of the high and low rail has a significant influence on gauge widening and rail rollover. As you see here, as we move from the left to the right, from a new rail condition, our B to H ratio or our L over B for rollover is around 0.65. That's about a maximum of where you want to be. As you start to develop in the middle moderate rail wear, that, that uh, threshold for rollover drops to about 0.53. And then in the far right, where you get severe gauge face rail wear, our, our B to H or L over B for rollover may drop in the 0.4 range. So you see, as rail wears, I'm not saying that the rail on the right can't, can't support the wheel loads, but it does reduce our, uh, our ability to prevent rail rollovers by lowering the, the rollover threshold uh, down to 0.42. Now, the thing about it is there's not many truck side L over Vs of 0.65 running around North America. Uh, I've seen lots of data from TPD sites. Uh, that's pretty hard to get, but 0.42, yeah. There's a lot of trucks producing 0.42 L over V. So you see you open the door here uh, when you let your rail, your gauge face wear becomes excessive. And here's an example of a, a rail that came out of a mainline derailment, believe it or not. Uh, and you see how the B to H ratio was dropped to about 0.4, uh, even though the rail was still in service and, quote, not condemnable. And the other thing about wheel rail profile contact is on the low side of curves, as we move the contact point towards the field side, it also makes the low rail much more conducive to rollover than the high rail. And remember our old friend, Mr. Nadal, the Frenchman, who first developed the L over V concept for wheel climb, said that the, the uh, L over V to initiate wheel climb is a function of both the angle between the wheel and rail and the friction present at that interface. And as that angle becomes more and more shallow, the required L over V to initiate wheel climb gets lower and lower down in the 0.5 to 0.6 range at severe or very shallow gauge face angles. And on the wheel side, uh, hollow wear wheels are a reality in, 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 in North America. We have them. Uh, we finally got a standard several years ago. I think it's uh, four millimeters of hollow tread is now the uh, AR interchange standard. Um, but hollow wheels are a reality. And the problem is that hollow wheels hunt. They hunt at high speeds. They don't steer well. And they cause rolling contact fatigue. So we also have to manage our wheel profiles as possible. Now, why are hollow worn, worn wheels bad? Well, here's an example of a, a newly tapered wheel. And as we go in a curve, we develop a larger radius on the outer wheel than the inner, which gives us a strong steering moment. But with hollow tread wheels, because of the hollow wear and, and the false flange, you may develop the same radius on the outer wheel as the inner wheel, which results in zero steering or a cylindrical tread profile, basically. So that's one of the reasons you don't want hollow worn treads. And finally, uh, just to show you the wheel rail contact positions and, and steerability and curves, uh, what we like on the left is called conformal contact, which gives us good steering. But as the rail wears and the wheels hollow, we move towards moderate two-point contact, which is okay, uh, but not the best. And finally, as we move to more severe two-point contact on the right, we get very poor steering effect and gauge widening derailments. So our conclusions are that you need to measure and be aware of your wheel and rail profiles, okay? Uh, either bring a contractor in to do it or do it yourself, but you need to know what's going on. And there's also wheel measurement systems that can be embedded in the track uh, to automatically measure wheel profiles. Rail grinding is an essential component of a wheel rail management system. It removes rolling contact fatigue to prevent broken rails. It helps to maintain your gauge face angle greater than 70 degrees to prevent wheel climbs. And it also promotes good steering both on high and low rail. You should also evaluate your rail wear limits, not only for de defect growth, but also for the Nadal uh, 
coefficient for wheel climb and the B to H ratio. Uh, currently in North America, we do not have rail wear standards, uh, but uh, as, uh, as I've shown you, the amount of rail wear can influence both wheel climb and rollover. Now, wheel profiling is harder to justify in our interchange fleet in North America under the AR billing rules. But for those of you who have closed or captive systems like transit systems, uh, mining port to mine to port railroads or commuter railroads, you should really look at profiling your wheels periodically to maintain the best steering. An excellent reference source for managing the wheel rail interface is the Heavy Hauls uh, Handbook on uh, guidelines for uh, heavy haul uh, management of the wheel rail interface. And that's available at the International Heavy Haul Association. And another excellent seminar is the uh, wheel rail interface or interaction seminar. This year will be in Chicago, hopefully uh, October 18th to 21st. Uh, but go to their website, the WRI website, for further data. But this is a great four day seminar where you can learn from many experts in the field all about managing the wheel rail interface. All right, step six is to develop an effective lubrication, uh, rail lubrication program. Now, rail lubrication is, or friction modification is essential in today's heavy haul environment. Um, it's essential to uh, promote the life of our wheel and rail asset, certainly. But on the other side, it's also essential in lowering derailment risk because proper lubrication of the gauge face will reduce your wheel climb potential and proper top of rail lubrication will significantly reduce gauge spreading forces and rail rollover potential. So not only does lubrication provide longer asset life, but it also lowers derailment risk. Now, current best practices, you might say, in a curve is to uh, elevate the gauge face of the high rail with a very good uh, lubrication coefficient of friction in the 0 0.1, to 0.2 range if possible. And on the top of the low rail, maintain a moderate level of lubrication between 0.3 and 0.4. Now, I don't have time today to explain to you why. If anybody wants further data on this, let me know. But these are the best practices of what railroads are trying to achieve. And so there's an example of a good, uh, say, a 0.2 or 0.25 friction on the gauge face and a very moderate uh, friction on top of the low rail of curves. The other benefit, as I said, of top of rail lubrication in curves is it will greatly diminish your, uh, your lateral uh, creep forces that tend to create rail rollover conditions. This is some test data I collected many years ago on some of my first lubrication tests. Uh, the red line is favorable lubrication. This is a percent exceedance chart. And you can see that with favorable lubrication or moderate lubrication of the low rail, uh, we kept the, the forces under 15,000 pounds per wheel. But with unfavorable or dry top of rail, we had a number of wheels producing forces between 15 and 21 or 22,000. And those are the high risk forces that generate permanent tie deformation, crushing of wood fibers, and potential for rail rollover. So again, it really greatly reduces your derailment risk. So there's many good reasons to lubricate or to provide friction modifications. It will reduce your forces, your noise, your rail wear, uh, wheel wear, tie and fastener wear, or spike killing, and in yellow, it reduces your derailment potential. Now, there's kind of a question about do you use lubricants or friction modifiers? Lubricants are greases or petroleum or carbon-based uh, oils. Uh, their effectiveness depends on how much you put down, and it's hard to control the application rates. Another reported downside of, of greases and things is that they can act as hydraulic uh, uh, as a hydraulic fluid to, to essentially open up surface cracks under the tremendous pressures uh, under wheel rail interface loadings. So that's not good either. Now, friction modifiers like the Kelsan products and Whitmore products are engineered solids or materials that are deposited typically in a water-based medium and it evaporates as a film. It also provides a constant coefficient of friction over the life of the film, so it's easy to control and it does not act like a hydraulic fluid. And the question is for any railroad, how do you achieve it? You can have wayside systems, you can have wheel mounted systems, you can have high rail truck mounted systems, you can have onboard locomotive systems. Uh, and there's many ways to skin the cat here. Each railroad has to figure it out on their own 
which is the most cost effective way. So determine your critical locations, mostly severe curves greater than five or six degrees, and certainly on heavy grades are where you want to consider uh, your first lubrication applications. Uh, determine your best delivery method based on your traffic density, uh, high rail access, cost benefit trade offs, and the type of friction modifier you're going to use. And be careful of areas requiring high tractive and braking efforts, such as ruling grades, and work with your transportation department to be sure you're not getting any wheel slips. And also be cautious of areas of heavy rail shelling because certain greases can promote the development of larger cracks. Strategy seven is to eliminate rail cant, which is the outward canting of the tie plate and rail due to more cutting of the wood fibers on the outer edge of the tie plate. And you end up with a rail that looks something like this. It's a, it's a leading root cause of many of our wide gauge and rail rollover derailments. And it leads to the, uh, also, uh, it leads to the development of rolling contact fatigue as the rail cants out and our wheel rail interface becomes uh, not so optimal. Currently, we don't regulate rail cant in North America, but most, most railroads are starting to measure rail cant and take corrective actions uh, from their geometry car data. So this is what rail cant looks like, uh, where we have about a quarter inch of plate cutting on the gauge side of the tie plate and roughly inch and a half of plate cutting on the outer side. Now, this may not be a defect. It doesn't violate any of the 213 rules, but it does put us at high derailment risk for this reason, that as the rail tips outward like this, you move the vertical load application point closer to the field side, which reduces your L over V or V to H ratio for rail rollover into very dangerous levels. And also thinking uh, you don't have this problem with concrete, think again, this is a rail seat abrasion resulting in rail cant on a concrete tie. To remediate rail cant, uh, obviously rail uh, tie replacement would be the best thing if you have the money. If you're only going to spot in ties here and there, be careful because you might lead to some very irregular track surface. If you put new ties in with canted ties, uh, that's not good either. Tie adzing uh, is a good solution to renew your tie surface and to eliminate cant. Shims can be used on a temporary basis, and we always uh, recommend epoxy plugging components versus the old wood plugs when you go back and respike your track. You can also remediate rail cant on concrete ties with epoxy, and you should always grind your rail. Uh, to proper contour after restoring rail cant, or you're going to end up with some really screwy uh, wheel rail contact mechanics. Strategy eight is to eliminate tight side bearings and excessive friction wedge rise on all vehicles. These little things called friction wedges is a small component of the truck, but they're very important in controlling the dynamic stability of a freight car in terms of hunting, in terms of steering, in terms of rocking, in terms of bouncing. There's a couple of common uh, designs in North America that we use, the ride control or constant, camp, uh, constant uh, damp design in the top. And in the bottom, we have the Barber S2 or variable damp design. And also we have the motion control truck now, which has seen widespread uh, acceptance, which is also a variable damp design. And this shows the various gauges used to assess friction casting wedge drives. If you're not familiar with these gauges, you should be, and you should be checking this. Uh, at your uh, repair facilities. So friction wedges help reduce the harmonic rock and roll effect at speeds between 15 and 25. They help eliminate vertical bounce at speeds above 55. They also help to restore truck stability and eliminate hunting at high speeds. And finally, during curve negotiation, friction wedges help to keep the truck square and maintain good steerability and curves. Now side bearings, come in uh, different types and uh, uh, styles. Uh, years ago, all we had were the single and double steel roller side bearings. And even before that, we had the steel block. Uh, but then in the 1970s, we developed these uh, various constant contact designs to help reduce truck hunting. The problem with tight side bearing clearance, whether it's on a constant contact or a standard roller is it causes premature contact or premature uh, development of high uh, uh, forces in the, if it's a constant contact side bearing, you inc increase your preload 
uh, more suddenly as, as you enter the spiral of a curve. As you go into the spiral, your bolster is trying to steer or rotate against the car body. And if you have uh, premature contact, you have the potential to get with a common roller design, some slip stick action, where you might start developing high friction at the side bearing location and cause a stiff bolster. As I said, uh, constant contact with setup heights less than four and seven eighths inches can also significantly increase turning resistance. The second problem though, that a lot of people don't understand is that tight side bearings can cause rapid and premature unloading across diagonal corners of the car when encountering even compliant track twist conditions. And this increases the probability of wheel climb derailments because it decreases the vertical weight on the wheel. So on side bearings, if they're too tight, you're gonna have stiff trucks, binding trucks, poor curving. Uh, you also get vertical wheel unloading when encountering track twists, and you're gonna get wheel climb derailments as a result. And if you have too much clearance, though, you will enhance the harmonic rocking of the car. Strategy number nine, we're getting to the end here, hang on folks, uh, is to manage continuous welded rail and your rail neutral temperature. Now, I'm a firm believer that most track buckles occur in the winter months of January and February. And I hear the laughter out there already uh, thinking, what's this guy thinking here? Well, the reason I say that is it's in the winter months that we tend to reduce our neutral temperature of the rail because we tend to put more plug rails in. Uh, and also the curves tend to pull inward every winter. And that's what sets you up for the ultimate buckle in May and June as we're coming into track buckle season right now. So pay attention in the winter months to what's going on with your track structure. The fact is you can lay continuous welded rail at the correct neutral temperature of 90, 95, or 100 degrees, but every seasonal change you're going to have a general or a gradual ratcheting downward of that neutral temperature. And the lower uh, RNTs is a major root cause of track buckle derailments. Uh, I've been involved with the uh, VERSE system that, that measures uh, rail neutral temperatures, and we've gone out on track that the Roadmaster thought was 95 degree neutral, and we've come up with measurements in the low 60s or high 50s, 30 or 40 degrees off from where they thought it was simply because they haven't paid attention to proper management. The areas that are subject to large seasonal temperature changes are most susceptible to track buckles are the upper Midwest in North America, where it might be 100 degrees in the summer or minus 30 in the winter. Uh, we don't tend to have as many buckles, say in the uh, lower 48 around Texas, Arizona, Southern California, where temperatures remain high most of the year, but it's where we have these large swings. And keeping it at the proper level is a continuous battle that must be fought annually. You can't be complacent. You have to constantly evaluate, check, and measure for lowering of RNT. If you've never seen a track buckle, here's a typical S buckle that we see on light curves and tangent. And here's the familiar C buckle that occurs in, uh, in curvature, uh, tighter curves. Both of them are not good. Both of them cause uh, catastrophic derailments. And here's our pull apart in the winter which is another downside of incorrect rail neutral temperature. Some symptoms where you need RNT adjustment are where you've put recent rail plugs in, uh, especially during cold months, or you've put curved patch rail in, uh, maybe during the, the, the shoulder months, or you've done recent tamping to correct lateral or vertical perturbations, or areas where you have poor ballast section, cribs and shoulders. These are all areas subject to lowering of the neutral temperature. And if you spot nervous rail or rail that is crowding the plates or canting in and out on your inspections, that tells you you've got to stop, you've got to uh, cut some rail out and make your proper rail neutral uh, temperature adjustments. And if you do state curves, which some railroads do, keep an eye on their uh, movement, uh, the, the track movement in the winters of how much the curve is moving and the formation of, of ballast uh, pockets and tie skewing or anchor movement or tie bunching is another symptom of poor rail neutral temperature. A lot of people don't realize, but if you tamp track to remove vertical uh, dips and uh, ups and downs in your track, you're actually adding rail through the process of tamping and that can effectively lower neutral temperature as well. 
To monitor rail neutral temperature, you can do visual inspection of staked curves or just do your, your high rail inspections looking for nervous rail or crowding of plates. And verse testing is another excellent way to get a handle on your neutral temperatures. Uh, it's the only method currently that we have that's accurate within about one or plus or minus one degree accuracy. And uh, it's, it's, I know it uh, takes a little more time to use the verse system, but it gives you very accurate results. I'll also show you in a moment some recent technology that we also have to keep track of rail strain. So if you haven't seen it, this is the verse system in use. It uh, has a little lifting mechanism. And by the amount of force required to lift the rail, that can be um, calibrated to the rail neutral temperature, a very accurate system. And now we've got some new developments. This is the multi-sensor from Vortok, a, uh, one of the Pandrel companies uh, that can measure strain in the rail. It's a very simple plug and play type device uh, that's out there now and in service. And then LB Foster has come up with a product uh, with their salient uh, subsidiary to also monitor rail strain uh, over, over time periods. Uh, strategy 10 is to develop train makeup strategies and uh, uh, train handling strategies. Uh, here's an example of a very poorly made up train where most of the weight was in the rear portion of the train and all the empties were on the front end and you probably can already guess what happened. Uh, the results were not so good. So this is the things we have to look out for uh, in the era of precision railroading where we're starting to uh, put trains together without as much as an eye towards the dynamic stability of the train. We've got to keep a very close watch on this. And the paper that I mentioned earlier, Grady Cotham has authored, uh, uh, treats this subject in great detail if you want to download it from the Railway Age website. The fact is that the in-train forces developed between the couplers of cars are additive to all the other forces occurring at the wheel rail interface. And high or excessive in-train forces can cause a marginally stable vehicle to derail on marginal track conditions. So all things being equal, the car will get over your system. But if you impose 200 or 300,000 pounds at the drawbar, uh, you might push that car over the brink and set it off to the woods. And every effort should be made to minimize the development of excessive drawbar forces, both static and dynamic, and to develop and to limit the development of your lateral uh, forces due to coupler angularity. You must limit your traction and dynamic brake forces consistent with the strength of the couplers and the track structure. And this could include powered axle limitations, proper tonnage limits for your territory, and prescribed train handling rules for difficult territory as well as air brake rules. In undulating territory, sometimes just dropping speed five or 10 miles an hour can significantly reduce the kinetic energy in the train and lower your slack action uh, forces. And you may also want to consider in your train handling and makeup rules speed limits for certain vehicles that are susceptible to truck hunting like empty tank cars, bulkhead flats, and center beams. Proper trailing tonnage limits behind empty vehicles are necessary, uh, which should be based on your maximum curvature on the route, the expected buff and draft forces, and also your long car, short car coupler limits for that route. And notwithstanding uh, tonnage behind empties, though, you should always also have a standard or a regulation for how much tonnage is acceptable behind any combination of a long and a short car coupled together. Also, the number and placement of end of car cushioning devices in a train is critical. Once you get above 50 or 60 EOC use, uh, devices, I'm sorry, EOC equipped cars, you start to increase the dynamic uh, slack forces in the train considerably. And also you need restrictions on the placement of double stack and spine or articulated cars, as well as definitions for what constitutes a loaded or an empty platform. And you also need a restriction on the number of non-aligned locomotives in the contest. And I know this will make Mike Iden happy if he's listening. We've had some recent conversations about the entrainment of non-aligned uh, locomotives in road trains. And maybe Mike will have something to say about that next week. Okay, almost there folks, hang in there. A few more items. Perform root cause analysis on human failures. Um, this is a big, uh, 
uh, hot button for me. I, th I think, as I showed you on the charts, we're moving in the wrong direction on our human failures. And we've had some, some very bad accidents in the last couple of years uh, for failure to observe speed limits or signal indications or failure to secure trains. All these were preventable. All of these uh, resulted in the loss of in these three derailments here, probably close to 75 to 100 uh, uh, human lives lost uh, because of human failure accidents. The nature of human failure is that number one, fallibility is part of our condition. Nobody is perfect. We've got to admit that. Um, you know, a good hitter in baseball, a 300 hitter, misses the ball two out of three times. So uh, fallibility is human. And we ain't going to change that, folks. As hard as we might try, we're not going to change it. But we can change the conditions under which people work. And the challenge of our root cause analysis is to find the latent and the organizational conditions that lead to human failure and to change those because that's something we can do. As you've seen from my slides, the human failures are increasing in our industry, and this is not a good trend. These derailments are preventable. Uh, too many of our human factor derailments are repeat offenders. Uh, we're having uh, quite a bit of switch problems, uh, uh, run through switches, uh, uh, mishandling of switches, uh, running over derails. These things are, are repeat and, and they, they can easily be eliminated. And discipline is often the only corrective measure that many railroads are using. And in today's world, I think we need some more proactive approaches to dealing with human failure. There's been a lot of recent neuroscience research on human behavior in safety critical industries, especially chemical, uh, atomic industries, aircraft industries. I've done a lot of very forward thinking research and two sections of the brain have been implicated in the way people work in these critical environments. You have number one, the automatic habit system where humans get in the, in the, in the uh, process of doing things day in and day out the same way. And then one day something changes. The switch isn't lined, the derail's not off or whatever. But since it's been off the last 20 trips, we assume it's off today. And we don't really step away and consider what's going on in the environment. We act through our automatic habit system. And I think that leads to a lot of human failures. And then there's the conscious executive system, which takes longer for the brain to react, maybe a half to a second longer, but it's where we can step back and look at the factors in our environment and take the appropriate steps. Now, if you want further reading on this, a great book is called Thinking Fast and Slow by Daniel Kahneman. Uh, I really recommend this book. It will open your eyes to how humans behave here, and, and especially like in our system of the rail industry. So some steps or objectives to reduce our human failures is I think, and I, and I glean these from my experience in analyzing a lot of human failure accidents in terms of what goes on in the process of creating a human failure. But I've, I've noticed that uh, our job briefings are deficient in a lot of cases that, and especially we don't stop and reboot when the work plan changes. Many human failure accidents or a trend that I've noticed involves, you're going to go down and do a four step process. But after step three, you get interrupted for something. Maybe it's a radio call. Maybe it's to go somewhere else. And then you come back to do step four, you forgot where you were, and then you make an error. And so whenever we interrupt the job process, we should stop and reboot or take one or take 10 minutes to reevaluate what's going on. And this would involve things like uh, equipment securement and handbrake securement, blind shoves, switches, train speeds, bottling air, and what have you. But always, when you're doing your rules checks as managers out there, Talk to your crews about their last job briefing. What did it include? Or are they just talking about, you know, watch out for bee stings and slip and falls? Or are they really talking about the risk factors in the work environment? We need better efficiency and rule testing when we're out there on all shifts and not just doing the same old test from the same old crew from the same old location. Uh, team blitzes are also useful. All functional areas should be involved and proper record keeping is essential. We should also use our event recorder data and to some extent video data uh, to monitor what goes on on trains when management's not around and looking for train handling and train operations. I've also noticed uh, things are getting a little loose out there with train handling. 
I've had several derailments that I've looked at in the last couple of months where rail engineers are just not handling the train well. Uh, they're just shortcutting things. Uh, they're getting a little bit, uh, they're a little bit jo uh, throttle jockeying out there, and it's not good. Also, we need to develop good training requirements. We have a lot of new hires entering our industry. Uh, we need refresher training and territory familiarization training as crews move around under the scope of PSR. And we also have new equipment and technology out there like high adhesion power, remote control locomotive, distributed power, all complex systems requiring much more uh, deeper levels of training. Now there's also a training available uh, called situational awareness training or attention training. A great group if you're not aware of them is Randy Jamison and Dr. Smiley from Atticus Consulting. Many of our human failure accidents are based on what we call loss of situational awareness. But the question is, why do people lose situational awareness? And uh, Randy and, and Dr. Smilek have strategies for teaching people how to recognize when they're losing their situational awareness and how to snap out of it. Really good stuff, and it works. And there's also systems like the confidential uh, close call reporting system, CQRS, and the confidential uh, reporting and analysis system that are also available to railroads. And you also have to have an ongoing corporate review of your rules, bulletins, and procedures. Now, a very important point to leave you with is reducing human failures, unsafe acts, unsafe conditions, and human errors will also have a profound effect on improving the overall reliability and productivity of your entire organization. And in the world of precision railroading, this is what we're after is uh, less, uh, less defects, less faults, less disruptions in the network to give us a much more reliable uh, movement of goods. And finally, our last one here is drainage. I've been amazed at uh, some very large uh, uh, derailments resulting from uh, washouts and drainage conditions in the last couple of years. There's just a few of them here that have occurred and drainage is uh, a moving target. Uh, what worked 50 years ago may not work in 2020, and you constantly have to look at what's going on out there. Our FRA regulations in 213 says that drainage must accommodate the expected flow of water, quote unquote. The question is, what is the expected flow of water in Houston, Texas, or Omaha, Nebraska, or Scranton, Pennsylvania? Who knows? And the problem is, it's a moving target in reality as we become a more urbanized uh, nation with more concrete, more metal roofs, more pavement, et cetera. Um, in today's world, run or water runoff from roads and pavements now hit the drainage dishes in a matter of minutes. 30 years ago, it fell on pasture land, corn crops, cotton fields, and it ran off over weeks and months. Today, it's in our drainage ditches in 10 minutes, filling them to capacity. You must constantly evaluate the adequacy of your drainage and water carrying facilities in light of recent developments. And if not a catastrophic failure or washout, poor drainage or water management is the root cause of many of our track geometry defects and track buckles. They often initiate in spots with mud and wet ballast and, and, uh, and pumping ballast is where a lot of our geometry problems and derailment problems initiate. Now here's an example of an area in, in a metropolitan district that I'm aware of. Uh, look at all the warehouses and roads in this area. And in light blue, you see the, uh, the river and creeks. And I can tell you 40 or 50 years ago, this is all uh, cornfields. And look at it today. Now it's hard to see, but there's a railroad running along that river in there. But it's also easy to see when you get two inches of rain in an hour, where all that rain's gonna hit very quickly off of these metal roofs and pavement. There's very few retention ponds, very few ways to slow the onslaught. And here's another uh, place in America near an urban center where you see a nice uh, couple of small railroad yard here on the left, some uh, yard tracks. And you'll notice all the uh, uh, development on either side here, the, the housing, the roadways that all have storm drains and things all entering into that uh, uh, creek there. Now here's what this looked like just 30 years ago. This is a Google Earth shot of that same area, all farmland, all pastures. 
And so this is a pretty, uh, I know it's severe change, but this is what we're faced with in a lot of areas. Now, the final thing your bankers doesn't is to maintain your turnouts. My final message is here's the deal. You got about 10 million wheels running around North America, okay, on any given day. Some of them have thin flanges, fret hollow, and other defects. And every day, one of these wheels may show up at your interchange and enter your railroad. The problem is you can't control the 10 million wheels running around, but you can control your turnouts. And the better you keep your turnouts tuned up and you prevent uh, switch point gapping, you keep your switch point throw correct, you keep your heel blocks supported and tight and all your rail braces tight and keep your guard check, guard face within spec, the better you control these parameters, the much better chance you have of preventing switch point derailments. So to wrap this up, and thank you for hanging in there. Uh, remember that not all these strategies may be appropriate for you or your railroad, uh, nor may budget support them, but you've got to start somewhere. Evaluate where your railroad is weak and pick the low-hanging fruit with your available resources. Start small and build on your success. Again, as I said at the beginning, this is not an all-inclusive list, but you must also keep a full court press on all possible defects and conditions and at a minimum, ensure compliance with standards. And where needed, hire outside help to supplement existing staff. Uh, where you, when you get into more technical issues like uh, maybe lubrication or wheel rail management, uh, things like that. And finally, remember a good root cause uh, analysis of every incident is the essential starting point to reduce the number of derailments on your railroad. So that's the end, folks, and let's go for 1.0. That's my goal to you in the industry. I think we can make it. Uh, this is just a starting point, but uh, let's hear your questions now. I want to first thank Riley Edwards and Emma Jean Earnhardt for their help in putting this together. And uh, as this beautiful picture shows, let's have a great summer. Go see Alaska, a beautiful state. And if there's any questions, let's uh, hear them. If anybody's still there. Yeah, they're they're still here. I can I can tell you that, and that was excellent. Thanks so much. I'll start with a question from our speaker next week that you've already referenced, Mr. Mike Iden. Oh no. Well, what Mike asks is uh, locking center pins and bearing keepers. He acknowledges that these won't won't prevent derailments, but he says, will they potentially reduce the magnitude of damage in derailments? Do you have any comments on that? I'm sorry. Could you repeat the first part? You were a little fuzzy there. Locking center pins and oh, bearing keepers. Yeah, yeah, it's a that's a high high fast inside one, Mike. Thanks. Um, the bearing retainer clips were removed from our industry a, a number of years ago. I don't think they have much effect on preventing derailments, but they do prevent some of the damage from derailments. And locking center pins, of course, are used on most passenger equipment. Uh, I don't know the economics of that, Mike. Uh, it's, you know, we don't do it on freight equipment, obviously, for a number of reasons. Uh, the fact that we've got a million freight cars out there without them now, it'd be a, a very monumental effort to start changing over. But uh, again, I don't think it would prevent derailments, but it might prevent uh, some of the damage in the aftermath. Thanks, Gary. I'll, I'll try to ask, I'm going to pick and choose a few questions here at a variety of levels. Um, one of our listeners asked, in the case of this big data environment, how do you ensure that you're using the correct data for analysis? I know you had some slides where you showed everything going to the cloud. How do we know that we're picking the right data to answer certain questions? That's that's the million dollar question. I hate to evade the question, but uh, that's why I said you need strong data analytics people within your organization that can can find out what is the, uh, how do you separate what I call the critical few from the trivial many? Uh, it's it's a Pareto analysis. What is critical uh, to answer the questions that you need answered? I just read uh, where Norfolk Southern is using just a few key parameter measurements on locomotives to predict water pump failure, I think it was. And it was a presentation made at Saremsky's uh, a big data conference last December. Uh, that's just an indication that you only need to maybe zero in on a few data uh, points in order to provide answers to your questions. So the starting point is, what question do I want to answer? And then the second phase is, what data do I need to support that? And then you also, as I said, have to ensure data integrity. Um, for instance, if you're measuring wheels, 
and all of a sudden you got back to backs consistently of 56 inches, uh, I'm going to say your wheel, wheel detector's off. So you have to do uh, constant checks on your data to be sure you're getting accurate data. Next. Uh, this question is, I'm going to read it in, a, in two parts, and I'm going to read it a little bit backwards. But how do we how do we take advantage of some of the more basic empirical sources of, of track behavior and track maintenance data, like inspectors that are out there on the ground, and combine that with some of what you talked about in terms of big data analytics. How do we still take advantage of that boots on the ground knowledge when we're when we're looking at derailment causes? Yeah, the, the boots on the ground is essentially your your once a week or twice a week high rail inspections at 15 or 20 miles an hour. And I'm not saying they're they're not needed, but they don't provide a lot of data. Uh, after an inspector, what you come back with is generally a checklist that said, I tighten joint bolts, I tamp this tie up, et cetera. And we're not getting a lot of data from it. Uh, not saying again that it's not needed, but uh, it doesn't provide data. It's it's the first step in maintenance is fix what's broken. Uh, what's needed is data and measurements of, of uh, uh, like Georgetown provides a ballast uh, profile. How much ballast do we have? Data. Uh, how are tie conditions? How many spikes do we have? Uh, this is data. It's quantitative evidence. Um, whereas a high rail trip in an inspector truck is more qual qualitative in nature and therefore not as useful. So I really think we have to turn to things like geometry cars, automated detection systems that can provide us the data that allows us to move to predictive analytics uh, and, and preventive analytics and not just reactive uh, maintenance. Good, good answer. Thank you, Gary. This is one is a kind of a more broader transportation policy question. Do you have a feel for how railways stack up in terms of safety compared with some of the other modes? And do you think our industry deploys its resources efficiently to address safety? Again, another loaded question. Um, it's dependent on, on where you are. Some, some are doing it better than others. Uh, let me take the first part. How are we doing against other industries? I'm a I'm a watcher of of the airline industry, the nuclear industry. I read a lot of material, uh, oil and gas industry, because these are uh, where I find the leadership in safety. Uh, these 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 groups, uh, obviously, the you know, if a nuclear meltdown occurs, a plane crashes, you have catastrophic failures, and I'm finding that they're doing generally, especially on human failures, a much better job than the rail industry overall and not to say that some railroads aren't doing a good job on it but we have lots of room for improvement and we have lots to learn from following these other industries and not just looking inward at our own family uh, so that's some of my uh, advice is to to look at what's going on out in the other sectors of our industrial society uh, and as i said uh, you know as we look at our industry we're doing good, we're not getting that much worse, but we're not getting better. And that's my big problem, is any industry that's not improving things is an industry that's stagnant. And the data speaks for itself on slide four or five, go look at it. Over the last 11 years, we're just not making progress on human failures. And even on other derailments, we're not. So we need to really ratchet up our attention on this problem. That's why I put this presentation together. Yeah, that's another, again, a good response. I'm gonna. I'm going to pose one last question to you and then I'm going to type my email in the chat window. So if anybody didn't get their questions answered and they're pressing questions, send them to me and I will compile them and, and, and get them to, uh, to Gary. But the last question also relates to human factors. And you hit a little bit on this in your presentation, but you talked about using da data analytics to better address some of these human factor derailments. The, uh, the participant here said, can you elaborate this on this just a little bit more, how you could use data analytics in that capacity? Yeah, we're, we're collecting, uh, mostly by a federal mandate, we're collecting a lot of data on rules testing and efficiency testing. Um, uh, and, and we're collecting data on human failure accidents. And the point is, how are we using this data to uh, focus our management efforts on reducing these human failures? Uh, is the data just sitting in file drawers or and databases, or are we monthly scanning this data across our railroad, looking at what types of failures are we having? What are the weather conditions when failures are occurring? What type of what time of the shifts are the are the failures occurring? 
are we really slicing and dicing our human failure data to, to better understand what's going on and what is needed for prevention? And that's where I think we're, we're missing out. Yeah, we're collecting the data, we're sticking it in file drawers, and we're sending it off to the government. But what gets done from there on, I'm not really seeing uh, a lot of people using that data in, to, to, to good effect. Excellent. Gary, thank you so much. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to introduce the topic for next week. And then um, I, I can't thank you enough for being willing to do two seminars this semester. We really enjoyed it. But a similar line of, of, of thinking next week and a good provocative uh, presentation will be given by Mr. Mike Iden of Tier 5 Locomotive LLC, formerly of Union Pacific. Mike retired from Union Pacific a, nor a number of years ago. The title of, of Mike's presentation will be The Dual Challenge of Decarbonization and Improving the Fuel Efficiency of Freight Railroads. So it should be another great seminar. We'll see everyone in a week, hopefully. And, and Gary, once again, a sincere thanks to you and uh, hope you have a tremendous summer. Thanks again. Yeah, thank you, Riley. And if anybody has further questions or wants further detail on some of these points, my website or my uh, emails on the slide here. And this this will be uploaded to your system. Just like the last one was, if people Correct. missed it, they can go review it. Correct. Thank, thanks again, Gary. Have a great holiday weekend. You Take too. care. Bye.